want to talk to you tonight on something that you're going to have to chew on, on the purpose of sickness. You do realize that when our Lord allowed sin to come into the world, and the Lord did allow sin to come into the world, he could have stopped it all, but as part of his plan, he allowed it. Now, I don't know why he allowed it. I don't know how he allowed it. I just know that that's what the book says. But beloved, anything could have flow out from that decision. But for whatever reason, one of the punishments of sin is sickness. Nobody on this earth gets sick, myself included. None of us get sick and don't deserve it. Every one of us deserve, because we are sinners, to be in hell right now. We have offended a holy God. We spat in his face when he sent that conviction to us and through our forefather Adam, we all died in him. Brothers and sisters, we all deserve to be sick, dead, and in hell. But by the grace of God, though, the goodness of God, we do have health. We do get to have life. We do get to have joy. We do get to know that our name is written in heaven. But it's not always easy when sickness invades your family. And the reason that sickness normally bothers us the most is twofold. Number one, we didn't see it coming. And number two, we can't make it go away. If you think about sickness, those are the only two things that bother you. The fact it hits you out of nowhere. And number two, no matter what you do, you can't make it stop. Brothers and sisters, John chapter number 11 tonight, I want to read from verse number 1 down through verse number 4 again. We're at the tomb of Lazarus, and watch what verse 1 says. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus. He was from Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now, brothers and sisters, we've been doing this enough time together. What does that verse teach you? That you can be the very one that worships God and sickness still come to your house. There is nothing you and I can do to keep sickness away. Now, we joke a lot about my germ issues. You can sanitize. You can do everything you can. You can wash your hands. You can eat healthy. You can eat green. You can eat no grease. You can eat vegetarian. You can be a vegan. You can eat monkey brains. You can do whatever you want. But when sickness comes to your house, there ain't a thing you can do about it. And it can, will, shall, and may come to somebody who's righteous. Watch what it says, though, in verse 3. Therefore, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Verse 4 is where I want to camp out tonight. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Father, tonight my brothers and my sisters have gathered into this room to sit down and to hear what thus saith the Lord God. And tonight, our Heavenly Father, we have gathered into a very, very difficult passage. Lord, it is so hard for somebody like me to express what you really want said. Father, how in the world can we say to righteous people that bad stuff is still going to happen no matter how righteous you live? But Lord, you promised that the, he, the Holy Spirit, would be our teacher. So tonight I am imploring you, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Open our eyes that we might see. Open our ears that we might hear. Open my voice that it might speak, my mind that it might think, my spirit that it might perceive. And I will praise you tonight, for it is now in the glorious blood-stained name of Jesus. Amen. 
and amen. Well, brothers and sisters, Lazarus is sick. In verse number 1, we find out that when we come into this passage, Lazarus has already contracted whatever it is he has contracted. Now, we don't know how long Lazarus was sick. The Bible doesn't say that. It never one time tells us how long he was sick. All we know is that at some point when the word is sent from Mary and Martha that Jesus tarries four days from the time of that moment to the time that he goes to meet our dear brother Lazarus. Now, they did exactly what they should have done. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you right now, the one area the devil will tear your spirit up is when you're doing the right thing and bad stuff still happens to you. We've got people right now in this church family that are walking through those valleys right this second. They are good people. They are righteous people. They are people that do their very best. We joke about it, and this is what I say. They pay their tithes and they wear their tithes. That means they come to church and they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing, but sickness still found there. Now, don't go out here and say, Tyler said you got to wear a tie in order to be right. Just sit down. You know what I'm talking about, all right? And you are doing everything in your power, but sickness comes. And yet what happens to Mary and to Martha is what happens to you and I. The moment sickness hits your house, it is a spark that lights your faith on fire. And verse number 2 tells us exactly what they do. Whenever the sickness finally gets to that place, what do they do? Do, they send the messenger to Jesus. Put in verse number two where you can apply this to his, your life. You know what they did in verse number two? They prayed. They sent and went after Jesus. They went after somebody that could do for them what they could not do for their self. That's what happens to you and I. When sickness hits our family, sickness hits our life, death comes into our family, that spark of faith, it rises up and it says, no, this should not be, no, this does not belong, no, no, I'm going to do something about this. And they send for Jesus. And let me just stop and take one of the timeouts that I am rendered every time that we gather into the house. I'm given five by the staff every time I come into church. It's like an NCAA game. I'm given five timeouts, and I'll take my first one right here. Let me say a timeout. Just because God hasn't answered does not mean you should stop praying about that thing. If God hasn't healed, you keep on praying. I read again in Luke chapter 18 the other day, verse number 1. It is God's will that men ought always to pray and not to faint. We keep praying, we keep going, we keep laboring, we keep doing what God's called us to do. But he tarries and he waits. And on this side of the story, we find that the disciples look at Jesus and say, Don't you know he's sick? And it doesn't sound good, Jesus. It sounds like he's about to die. Watch what Jesus says. He said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. I want to give you the, that's a messy translation right there. I'll give you what it actually says in the Greek in simplified terms. This is what it means. This story will not end in death. It will end in the glory of God. Can I show you something that occurred to me yesterday and the other day, Friday rather, when I was looking at this? I want to show you how God views sickness. Will you look in verse number, uh, let's look in verse number 1 and in verse number 3. Watch what man describes Lazarus as. Verse 1, now a certain man was what? Say it out loud. He was what? Sick. Look in verse 3. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Whenever man described Lazarus, they said he is sick. Four different times in chapter 11, it's going to be said by people that Lazarus is sick. But Jesus only talks about Lazarus one time. And watch what he says in verse number 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, this, what? Sickness. 
Now, brothers and sisters, we are the type of people that believe every word in the Bible is inspired by the Holy Ghost. Therefore, if it says man looks at him and says he's sick, but when God looks at him and says he's got a sickness, it's got to be a reason. Can I show you the reason? I'm going to put the two different words up on the screen for you, and I'm going to show you what happens when you listen in grammar in school. Whenever you look in chapter number 11, you see the word sick, it's a verb. Lazarus was sick, it's a verb. But when Jesus describes it as a sickness, you look it up in the Greek, it's a noun. Now I know what you're sitting there saying. What in the world's he talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. Whenever man looked at Lazarus, they described him with a word that indicates a state of being. As if something about Lazarus' person had changed. But when Jesus described it, he described it as a noun. What's a noun? A person, place, thing, or idea. It is a separate... I'm going somewhere. Watch this. It's a separate entity. When man looks at sickness, they look at it as engulfing the entire person and changing them. You ready? They have cancer. They are dying. But when Jesus describes them, he doesn't describe it as a state of being that's taken over the whole person. He describes it as a thing that has come upon a person. Therefore, if it's a thing that's come upon the person and not a state of being that has changed the person, as a thing that has come upon the person, it can also be a thing that what? Leaves the person. When you look at somebody that has cancer, it changes everything that you think about that person. But God says, I want you to pray the prayer of faith. You don't now look at that person saying, I'm trying to change that person. You look at that cancer as a thing that has come on that person. And if it's a thing that's come on that person, it's a thing that can get off that person. If it's a sickness that's got on that person, it's a sickness that can get off that person that allows you you to pray in faith when you see it as an outside invader that has come on that person it allows you to hunker down and say no nah, we're about to do battle in this situation right now and I'm going to get this thing off of that person therefore whenever you pray whenever you see it like Jesus sees sickness as a thing that can go and not a state that doesn't change it'll help you pray but some of you are saying Lord I prayed and the thing didn't leave you ready? The story ain't over. Just because the thing ain't left don't mean the thing won't leave. You say, but they died. I done told you the story ain't over. Just because you're at the end of a chorus doesn't mean there's not another verse. And whenever you realize that person has not changed, it's just something that's come on them. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to give you three statements tonight because I can tell y'all going to eat this up on a Sunday night in the house of God. There's three statements out of verse number four that I want to leave you some encouragement with because if you'll start looking at sickness like Jesus looks at sickness, you'll be a lot less apt to get into discouragement and despondency and despair and despair depression because then you'll start seeing wait a second there's something bigger going on in this story three statements I want you to write these three statements down at a verse number four number one the first statement is this sickness and death can bring glory to God sickness and death can bring glory to God Watch what he says in verse number 4. Jesus said when he had heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, the most important element in the entire universe is the glory of God. The most important thing you and I can think about is the glory of God. The Westminster Confession, the Presbyterian Confession, they probably summed it up the best when they said this. They said that the chief 
end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. At the end of the day, my life has got one goal, and that's to bring glory to God. Your life has got one goal, and that's to bring glory to God. It's not my job to be something. It's my job to give something. So therefore, no matter where I'm at, I can give God glory. No matter what I do, I can give God glory. I'm an old-fashioned kind of Christian. You know what? I, I believe you can give God glory glory in absolutely everything. I'm not the kind of Christian that thinks you only give God glory in church. I think you can give God glory when you wake up in the morning by lifting up your eyes and saying, Lord, thank you for letting me wake up. Lord, before I get out of the bed, I want to thank you for keeping me safe in the midnight hour. I believe before you wake up out of that bed, you say, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that I upgraded to that Tempur-Pedic. I want to say thank you that I got that pillow up under my head. I want to say thank you for that fleece blanket that lays over my body. I want to say thank you for my, my Minnetonka bedroom shoes and I'm about to put on my feet. I want to say thank you for that pot of Folgers black silk that's a waiting on me in the kitchen. I want to say blessed be the name of the Lord as I pour that French vanilla coffee made inside of that cup of coffee. God, I want to say thank you for that donut that you let go in my body. I want to say thank you that I got teeth inside of my head or I got teeth in my cup that I can put inside of my my head. God, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for the shower that's going to be in my bathroom. I want to say thank you for the hot water that's going to fill that shower head. I want to say thank you for that 132 count half Egyptian cotton that we got down at the dollar store that's going to wipe off my dirty body. I want to say thank you. God, I want to say thank you for the shoes you put on my feet. I want to say thank you for the pants on my legs. I want to say thank Thank you for the shirt on my back. I want to say thank you for the vehicle I get to drive. I want to say thank you for the Chick-fil-A I get to go to. Say amen right there. I want to say thank you for being good to me. It doesn't matter if you're at church. It doesn't matter if you're out in the world. Everything you see, you can use it as a tool to give God glory. But this is what takes you from being a Christian to a deep Christian. Not just giving him glory for the good stuff. Giving him glory, not for the bad stuff, but in the bad stuff. When you look at a thing and say, God, I would have never picked this for myself. But evidently, you thought it best for me. I say glory to the Lamb of God. Brothers and sisters, what happens is these bad things come on our life and we think life shuts down. We think the story ends. We think there's a pause in the whole thing and we stop giving Him glory and we stop doing the things that we used to do. You know what you ought to be doing? Exactly what you feel like you can do. If you got enough strength, do the same thing. If you're laying on your back, weary as you can be, lift your eyes up to heaven and say, God, I still got eyeballs in my head and I want to give you glory in the sick you can give God glory. There are people in this room right now. The devil has lied to you. He's told you because you're grieving, you can't give God glory. He's told you because you're sad, you can't give God glory. He's told you because you're angry, you can't give God glory. Who made sadness? Who made anger? Who made joy? Who made happiness? Who made sadness? It is our great God which fills the heavens and the earth and the heaven of heavens. Can't even get him all in there. It's the God of heaven. Therefore, I can take whatever I am and say, God, I give you glory for what I have to deal with right this minute. Johann Sebastian Bach, me and Dave and Nick, maybe Troy, some of the music, maybe the only people that recognize that name. Johann Sebastian Bach was one of the greatest composers that has ever lived, ever. Whenever he would begin a piece of music, he would begin it with two letters, J, J. And then when he would end that song, he would end it with three letters, S, D, G. At the beginning of the song, J, J, in the Latin it was Jesus Juve. It literally means Jesus help. But the SDG at the end of the song literally means sola de gloria. All glory to God. 
They asked Bob, they said, why did you say at the beginning of your peace, Jesus, help? And at the end of your peace, you said, to God be the glory alone. He said, that's simple. He said, the only way to make a song make sense all the way through and to get to the end is for Jesus to help you. But if Jesus will help you get all the way through the song, you'll get to the end and say, to God be the glory alone. You say, Brother Tyler, I am so weak. I am so tired in this sickness. I am so angry with what's going on in my family in the sickness. I am so sad about the death. Don't be upset. Don't try to give God glory before you ask Him for help. He knows how sad you are. He knows how frail we are. We know, he knows how broken we are. So you wake up and you say, Lord, help me today. Help me to give you glory. Help me to give you honor in my sadness. Help me to give you glory in my pain and in my sorrow. And then if you'll ask God for help and you get to the end of your story, you'll be able to lift your hands after it's all said and done and say, by your grace and by your power, I give you glory alone. Sickness and death can still bring God glory. You ever thought about this? Not one time does Jesus ever say, in life I give, you can give glory to God. But he does say this sickness is for the glory of God. Why are believers most like Christ when we glorify God in pain and sickness? Because it is the time when you recognize what doesn't belong, but what you desire the most. It's when you say, God, it should not be this way. But I still say you're worthy. In your sickness and in your family's sickness, here ought to be your prayer. God, help me to live every emotion that comes my way, bringing glory to your name. Number two, the second statement I want to give to you. Now, I made up some words on this one, so y'all don't judge me for my grammatical issues on this one. But number two, God brings something out of nothing. God brings some things out of no things. Well, where do you get that from? I, I thought about this, and I don't know if it even matters, but I want you to think about what Jesus said in verse 4. He said, sickness, death, bring God glory. Are there any words there that don't seem to go together? Sickness, death, glory. Do you know what the word glory means in the Hebrew? It literally means the exuberance of God. Sickness, death, exuberance. It's like saying from a Volkswagen we're going to get silk sheets. It's like saying from a backhoe we're going to bake a cake. you got two things that don't even belong in the same sentence. Am I right about it? Don't sit there and look at me. It'd be the equivalent of me saying, we're going to bake a chocolate cake, dip it down in whole milk, and lose 15 pounds in one sitting. It don't even, it don't even go together. You look at that and say, no, nah, you crazy. And that's exactly what a lot of people do when they sit in the valley of sickness and a preacher says, God will bring glory. You sit there and think, no. Nah. Not from mine. You obviously don't know what I got going on. I know. But you see, God doesn't bring all things out of some things. God brings some things out of no things. You see, when you and I create things, we got to have a starting point. When you and I do things, we've got to have some pieces of the puzzle to put the thing together. That's not how God operates. God doesn't have to have a starting point. He makes a starting point. 
God doesn't have to have pieces of the puzzle. He's the one that drew the whole picture to start with. And so God is in the process of bringing some things out of no things. Y'all act like I'm making that up. You do realize that through the course of the Bible, it has been the pattern of God to use nothing to create everything. You realize God's never created one thing and started with anything. When he reached into the bucket of nothing, he scooped out six days worth of everything. When he went down to the Red Sea, he brought forth dry ground. Whenever he brought David out onto the battlefield, he had a shepherd and turned him into a king. Whenever Elijah was on top of Mount Carmel, from the hands of nothing came the, the rain and the size of a man's hand. From a womb of a virgin where there was nothing. He brings forth the Lord Jesus Christ from an empty tomb or from a tomb full of dead man's bones. He brings forth life and mortality and from a life of sin and despair washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus. He brings forth righteousness. God always brings forth some things out of no things. So therefore, if you are facing a situation or you're trying to see God turn it around and you don't even know where to start, you're exactly where you need to be. If you don't know what to do, God says, bingo was his name-o. God always starts with nothing and brings forth something. You know, liberals just... I disdain liberals. I can't stand liberals. I hate everything. I hate liberal politicians. I hate liberal theologians. I hate liberal, th I hate liberal preachers. I don't like a liberal. I can't stand a, I'd rather lick asphalt than go talk to a liberal. I hate a liberal. Now, I like liberal givers, but I, I hate every other kind of liberal. I don't like a liberal. You know, it's always amazing to me how liberals are trying to disprove everything and prove nothing. This one old boy got saved. He was an alcoholic. I mean, he drunk away his entire paycheck every single week. He, he drank away everything he ever, ever thought about earning. If he had a paycheck, he drunk it away. Just, just alcohol would eat him up. He got saved by the grace of God, turned his family around, just changed his entire life. And one of his old liberal buddies down at the office, he came up to him and he said this. He said, do you really think that God brought forth the entire world in six days from nothing? He said, I sure do. He said, do you really believe that God brings all that out of nothing? He said, I sure do. He said, well, tell me what you mean by it. He said, I can't really tell you all that. He said, but I know this. He said, I know God turned alcohol into furniture in my house. You see, God has a funny way of taking nothing and making it something. And so inside of your heart, and you're trying to pray, and I still believe in the prayer of faith that will save the sick. I still believe in old-fashioned Holy Ghost, God-moving, miracle-bringing power that can pray out sickness. I have seen it with my own eyes, and it's about time that the people of God start ex stop excusing away our lack of faith and start praying and watch God move. But to those of you that have walked through the valley where God decided not to heal, you're saying, God, I don't know what to do with this. God says, if you'll trust me, I'll bring something out of nothing. I give the third statement from verse number four. The fourth thing I want to give to you. Now, this is the juicy one. This is the best one of them all, Troy. This is that statement right there that ought to go down in camp meeting history, buddy. You ready? I can look in y'all's eyeballs and tell y'all, y'all ain't ready. This section right here is about as unready as ever could be. You ready? Because there's some of you that have watched sickness take a life. Here's the line. No matter the earthly outcome, a child of God's story never ends in death. No matter the earthly outcome, a child of God's story never ends in death. Remember what the Lord Jesus said? 
The Lord Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. What did he mean by that? He said, this sickness is not going to end in death. This story is not going to have its finality in the grave. He goes down to the tomb of Lazarus. He looks at the tomb of Lazarus. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes out as the grave bursts open. Lazarus comes out and he's released from his grave clothes. And that which was dead and stinking was now filled with life. And it was filled with hope and the fragrance of the presence of God. Do you know what John chapter number 11 is? John chapter number 11 is a picture of the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ because one day graves are going to be filled with dead men's bones and dead men's corpse. All of those graves that the devil thought that he had beat those people in that grave. He thought the story was said and done. But on that day, our Lord is going to come out upon the poor of glory stack back the clouds and all the stars and with the shout and the call of rapture he'll say come up hither and what you're going to see is like brother Lazarus's grave tombs are going to start rolling open and graves are going to start releasing and all of a sudden those graves that held death bones are going to release those and they'll come out and together with the Lord you're going to realize in that moment you just thought the story ended the last time you were at the grave. You just thought the story was over when they turned the machine off. You just thought it was said and done when they said there's nothing else we can do. What you didn't realize is the story wasn't over. That chapter had just ended. But when you get to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ, it's like a good book. You're going to say part two and now the story is going to begin on that great and glorious day. No child of God's story ever ends in death. We've got to get to the point where we are resurrection minded. And we stop saying, but brother Tyler, they died. The story's not over. The story's not over. I'm not telling you it makes it an easy read. I'm just telling you to keep on reading. The story's not over. I believe with all of my heart, the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the further away we get from the Garden of Eden, our bodies are going to start breaking down harder, faster, and quicker than they ever have. We keep pumping our body with all this stuff, our bodies are going to begin breaking down harder and faster. We're going to deal with disease. Our Lord said in the last days there would be famine, there would be diseases, there would be sickness, there would be all manner of plague. We're going to deal with those things. But no matter what that disease does, even when it closes out the chapter that we're currently on, it's not the end of the story. For there is another day that's on the way. I love that song. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day! Glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear. No more sickness, no pain. No more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be.